Let's begin with the police and the police and school authorities at the University of Ghana have begun investigations into the death of level 400 female student believed to have jumped from the fourth floor of her hall of residence on Wednesday dawn. 23-year-old Jennifer Nyako, a consumer science student, was found dead in a pool of blood at the balcony of a Kwafa Hall Annex A. Uh, I know Jennifer is a nice person. She's friendly and then she talks a lot too. And she's a bit kind of jovial too. And then what I know in particular is that she loves herself. As for that, I'm very sure about that because she would buy any type of cream to make sure she's, her skin glows. She would do anything to make sure she looks good. I remember seeing her, but I don't know if it was ye in the morning yesterday or the day before yesterday. That is what I'm not too sure about. Well, I was asleep and then I heard noise, like someone was actually downstairs clapping and shouting. So I got to my balcony and then the person was like, we should make sure that all our roommates are inside. So, because someone had fallen down. So I went to the veranda and I checked and I saw that the body was lying there with blood over the head, where the head was positioned. What could make a 23-year-old final year student commit suicide? That is the question that remains unanswered on the lips of family, students and authorities of the University of Ghana who woke up to the horrific scene of Jennifer Nyako lying in a pool of blood after allegedly jumping to her death. It is unclear what may have caused her to allegedly jump or fall from that height, but some students say she has been moody and kept to herself lately. Describing the kind of person the late Jennifer was, her flaw and cosmate said she was friendly and open until this semester when she turned moody. The way she was last semester, she's not on herself. You could see something is disturbing her, but I can't really tell what it is. School authorities say the police have taken over the matter and are investigating what might have caused her death. It is unconfirmed whether the late Miss Nyako was suffering from any illness or disorder. Public Relations Officer of the University, Stella Amwa, spoke with Joy News. You await the report from both the hospital, from the police, and so for the other professionals, and then we can come up with really what happened. So for the moment, we do not want to be speculative and make any assumptions. I think this is a uh, very bad news, very disheartening for the University of Ghana. Her body has since been deposited at the Legon Hospital Morgue. For Joy News, Matilda Pamaga, Legon. Hey, hey. And suicide among students is gradually becoming common among the youth. A few weeks ago, an 18-year-old chemical engineering student of the KNUST was found hanging in her room. Speculations on what might lead to rise in suicide cases is emotional issues. Now, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ebenezer Odrowusu, is therefore urging students to open up and share their concerns with counseling centers set up on various campuses. He's worried that students are not making good use of such centers, thereby making them prone to suicidal tendencies have the counseling services there open to them but they don't take advantage of the services why, why don't they take advantage of it but you know the youth and the way they behave they don't even open up to their parents and that is a problem with the youth of today they don't open up with it to their parents they don't open up to people around them they keep things within them until they're unable to to handle so we all have to advise ourselves we have a role to play as a university the churches have a role to play, the, f the families, both extended and nuclear, have various roles to play. All of us have roles. I just spoke to the students and I told them, we must be each other's keeper. We must, we must show concern for one another. We don't leave to people to their faith because they are quiet. Of course, when there's a behavioral change in somebody, immediately you must begin to suspect. Even if the person is not open up, you have to reach out to the person. That, that is what we stand for as human beings. 
but we don't leave people to their fate because they are not opening up. So, uh, so the university has a counseling center, oh, but students are not really... A very vibrant one, a very vibrant one. Some students take advantage of a counseling center, and indeed, others do not. And so that is the challenge that we are facing. It's not only even in the university. I know even in most churches, they have counseling services. The youth are not taking advantage of that. But a little word, a whisper to somebody, would go a long way to solve a problem that you think is unsolvable. And we as a nation should begin to s make sure that we advise our youth to take advantage of such services. The 26-year-old restaurant manager who allegedly dipped the face of the female staff in Pepe has been remanded to police custody. This was after his request for bail was declined by the Bekan District Court here in Accra. The Belenpe branch manager of Mawako restaurant Jihad Chaban, who is accused of assaulting Evelyn Boache on February 26 this year, pleaded not guilty to all three counts against him. Join News Joseph Akable was in court and has more. Relatives of the accused paced the court's premises as they waited for the case to be called. Jihad Chaban told the court he was innocent of the accusation of assault, causing harm, and offensive conduct. Chief Superintendent Hansen Ama, who led prosecution, told the court the 26-year-old thrust the face of the caterer, Evelyn Boachi, into blended pepper and called her a prostitute in Lebanese when he realized she was using a blender. It was then a turn of lawyer Augustine Asafweje, who represents Jihad Chaban. He asked that his clients be granted bail since he had pleaded not guilty to the charge and had already been suspended by the company. He indicated Chaban was willing to cooperate with the court and should therefore be allowed to go home. Chief Superintendent Hansen Ama, however, disagreed, submitting that a branch manager could influence staff of the restaurant not to appear in court as witnesses if he's allowed to go home. Magistrate Victor Aganza declined the request, saying the accused should be remanded for his own safety. Lawyer Augustine Asafweje insists his client did not thrust the face of the caterer into the pepper as being circulated. The question is, was it in the, when the um, pepper was in the blender or where? Could the face have entered the blender? Those are some of the things sometimes issues come and you have to ask so that you get the correct facts. You just take the information and incite everybody against. You see, we are people where we have to also look at individuals who commit crime by themselves and not to generalize. Because the way we do our things, if we put people in groups and say they are all criminals, is that fair? He told the court he's a Ghanaian. Yes, he is. And the company is a Ghanaian company too. His ankles that you see with fair colors are Ghanaian. The incident that happened has been rep misrepresented. What, is the what are the facts? The, the facts, facts. As we have it now, the fact is that there was a splash of pepper into the face of the lady. Mistakenly or deliberately? It cannot be intentional. It cannot be intentional. It cannot be intentional. You understand? And where if, and have you bothered to find out whether the following day the girl went to work? The following day the girl went to work. He was, when the incident happened, he was on the night shift. The following day, 7 a.m., she was at work. The matter has been adjourned to March 16. Even though the Ashanti region chapter of the Lebanese Residents Association, the Lebanon Club, has condemned the alleged assault of the Morocco employee by her supervisor in Accra, its president, Haida Pani, is however worried about the generalization of the issue. He wants the law to take its course, but urges Ghanaians to look at the issue dispassionately and limit it to the conduct of that individual. We frown on such behavior. It's not condoned, and nobody should treat anybody in that manner. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, apart from this bad thing that has happened, you know, there are, there are about 10,000 Lebanese in Ghana. Previously, in the past, it was up to 50,000. Gradually, the numbers have gone down. And the, the, the community, the Lebanese community, knows that it has a responsibility to the Ghanaian society. And the responsibility, you know, you have been blessed to be in a country that has accepted you, has welcomed you, 
you are doing business, you are gaining from that country. Sorry to say, you don't crap where you eat. And you have to, the Lebanese community has been giving back to the society. Now to other issues, there is massive encroachment along the Achimota railway lines as some squatters have put up structures very close to the rail lines. A bridge that connects part of the rail line had also collapsed with some of the railway workers fixing it Wednesday afternoon. The situation has halted the movement of trains on that section of the rail lines. Minister of Railways Development Joe Gatti called the Achimota train station to get first-hand information on the situation on the ground. Join us, Maxwell Agbaba joined him and has come through with this report. Some squatters have put up structures some few meters away from the rail lines. The warnings on some of the structures have not deterred others from putting up similar ones. Rotten wooden sleepers, woody rail lines, and mini refuse dump have contributed to making the Chimota rail lines unattractive. Ghana's railway sector previously showed great promise, but these grounded, rusty coaches give you an indication of what the situation is like now. Some pundits have criticized the creation of the new Ministry of Railway Development. They say it's unnecessary. In the absence of the others, it's over the talk, which started from the Achimota train station, ended with an interaction between the minister and the railway workers. Speaking to the media, the sector minister, Joe Gatti, stated the ministry will work to revamp the sector. It's important that we work with those who have a coach on the corridor. They must understand that the standard gauge and the trains we are going to um, bring on board in the near future are the kind of trains that move very fast. In Second Eastern what happened was that they put some form, form of fencing on both sides of the track. There are a lot of um, temporary structures along here that we must deal with. I mean, but we are not going to deal with it in a violent man manner. We are going to let people understand that it's not even safe for them to be there. When you have a slow train that comes along once in a while and makes a lot of noise, you can live near the track. But if you are the, the kind of trains that we are going to employ is dangerous. So, well, it just, we are continuing our process of assessing what we need, our needs and so on. And I'm sure that we'll succeed. This is an impromptu, uh, as it were, visit because we have to address a specific situation. But it is not within our whole um, framework and our plan of action. I think we'll address all these matters. The railway workers also promised to fix the broken bridge in a week. Deputy Managing Director of Engineering at the Ghana Railway Company Limited, Michael A.J., enumerated some challenges facing the railway workers. Well, currently, apart from um, traveling a salary, which the Honorable has already promised that he's working on it, basically, uh, some of the challenges are um, tools and materials to work with, you know. And then, as you can see, just behind you, yeah. all these this, um, makeshift bridges that we're constructing mm. is just... Um, some sort of innovation that is coming from us, you know, but the proper thing has to be done. Hence, we inviting the Honorable Minister to come and have a look at it and see how best he can, you know, help us move forward. So basically, you know, we, we have a lot of challenges. We can't see all here, but uh, spare parts is one of them, tools to work with, you know, and other materials that will help the industry to, to grow. So basically, these are the challenges. Okay. Also, we'll be bringing you excerpts of special edition of our breakfast show hosted by the wife of the Vice President, Samira Baumia, and also hear from the First Lady on the occasion of International Women's Day. Economic Forum predicts the gender gap won't close entirely until 2186. We cannot wait that long. Stay and stay with us. There is more after the break. This is Joy News Prime. You're welcome back. Now, First Lady Rebecca Ekufuado has pledged her commitment to advocate for women in decision-making. She reiterated her pledge at a program to commemorate International Women's Day in Accra on Wednesday. Hannah Odame was there for Joy News. 
Celebrating on the theme, Be Bold for Change, women from various fields of industry represented at the office of the First Lady. Mrs. Ekufuado said, the need for political inclusiveness has become necessary as decision-making is no longer the preserve of men. But the World Economic Forum predicts the gender gap won't close entirely until 2186. We cannot wait that long. This is why the idea of being bold for change is so important. What if we all work together to take actions and make contributions that will get us closer to gender parity? We would sooner than later have a generation of women who are equal partners with men in all spheres of life. My own pledge is to forge women's advancement. I will advocate for more political inclusiveness of women. Former First Lady Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rawlings, who has been a champion for women empowerment, taxed female parliamentarians to approach the issue of women in a bipartisan manner. I would like, therefore, to take this opportunity to appeal to female parliamentarians to at all times approach all women's issues with a bipartisan approach. I'm also asking them that when a bill comes before parliament that advances the freedoms of women in Ghana, please, you must face this head on and push your male counterparts to do what is right for women. CEO of Alil Spa, Jigodi Dosu, and executive member of the Association of Ghana Industries, Nora Benaman Abbott, shared with Joy News how they have blazed the trail to become who they are. Some of us who through every kind of tragedy, every kind of pain, every kind of suppression, every single day still wants to make progress. You have to remember that there's something in you that can push you further than what you think, than what you imagine. That the empowerment lies in you already, the greatness lies in you already, the potential lies in you already, and the pot possibility lies in you already. And I am now throwing the challenge to women ministers and women MPs to think about getting together, creating a forum where they can meet women entrepreneurs like myself, understand what our challenges are, they can present these challenges even better, be the voices of the unheard, and help us to develop Ghana better. For Joy News, my name is Hannah Watame. Meanwhile, Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Charlotte Ose, has described the high rate of child marriages in Ghana as a national disgrace, stressing the country must bow its head in shame. According to her, Ghana is the first sovereign nation in Africa to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child on Child's Rights in 1989 should have set a better example by now. Charlotte also joined former chief executive of the Ghana Chamber of Mines, Joyce Ayer, and former Deputy Finance Minister Mona Korte on the special edition of Joy FM Super Morning Show, which was hosted by the Second Lady Samira Baumia to mark International Women's Day. Usually the party whose consent is not sought is the girl and she's usually forced or coerced. Wide range of issues affecting women's development were discussed by the esteemed ladies who took over the airwaves of Joy FM as well as the Joy News channel on TV. The practice where young girls of school going age are taken as wives to older men was widely condemned by the panelists. Chairman of the Electoral Commission, Charlotte Osei, did not mince words in expressing disappointment about failure of successive governments to end the practice, which is prevalent in the three regions of the North and Western region. I think the statistics are embarrassing. I think we should own the shame as a nation and realize that this is our collective shame. When that, that is our first step. We were the first country to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Ghana. It was a it was a place of pride. For the same country that was the first to ratify the, the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, to have such, such abysmal, shameful statistics on child early and forced marriages, it is a national disgrace. And so it means that the solution must 
come from all of us and the change must start from all of us. The practice considered a major challenge in the country is often attributed to poverty and low levels of education. The panelists, however, did not only condemn the practice, but also offered pragmatic solutions to limiting, if not ending, the warring trend. When we go back to our villages, we are not supposed to flaunt, you know, our advantage, but to actually create a situation where we can tell them that, you know, it's, it's not as difficult as you think. It's not as difficult as you think. It's attainable. I think that the safe house is an option, but then the role modeling is also a very important option. Thirdly, we still need to talk to our men. I think that a lot of times, even as women, when we are trying to free ourselves from shackles, we forget that we live in a community with men and getting their buy-in is very important. So we need to also identify some key opinion leaders in our communities who are men, who would actually be our allies as women as we work out these things. For the former Deputy Finance Minister, Mona Korte, it is financial independence that can liberate women from maltreatment. This is why it's important that as women, we should make ourselves financially strong so that we can sponsor our children through education and so forth, even if a man or the husband or the head of the household doesn't. That way, we have a say in what happens to the child. The panelists urged women to take advantage of all opportunities to empower themselves. Well, many women can identify with sexual abuse at their workplaces. For those who try to manage the situation by attempting to keep their dignity while saving their jobs at the same time, this experience can be very devastating. On this day, set aside for women worldwide, former chief executive of the Ghana Chamber of Mines, Joyce I, has been sharing her experiences and tips on how to overcome the challenge. I decided that under no circumstances would I allow my boss to have anything to do with me. My reason was simple. I would be so angry if the night before you have hanky-pankied with me. And then the next day, and the next day, not even giving me orders, trying to show off that you are my boss and putting me down for something I haven't done. I did face quite a number of temptations, but that resolve helped me. And I was always bold to say that, you know, this is my principle, I was always very charming about it. Yeah. You know, so charming about it, oh, you don't want to do that. Because can you imagine if you did something with me and the next day I came and I flaunted these things, you'd be you'd disgraced, be you know. So I think that th there's a way in which we need to help one another to be strong. Yeah. Now, speaking for the first time on this issue since she was appointed chair of the Electoral Commission by former President John Mahama, Charlotte Osei also said she was not perturbed by comments suggesting that she may have traded sex for the position she currently holds. My sense of self should not come from somebody who really doesn't even know me. Mm. Um, if the person thinks I got my job through sexual favors surely there are other more rewarding and less difficult jobs <laughs> i could have used that sexual favor for and in any case this is a man you're sleeping with other women so why haven't you given them this job through sexual favors but you see you know that as a woman you're coming into a space that men think they own and men believe they should keep that space to themselves so they're going to throw everything at you just to get you out of that space yeah. Once you recognize that, then you recognize those kinds of comments for the distractions that they are. Mm. And you just focus on doing what you've been called to do and to do an excellent job. And so I don't get my sense of self from... From people's from opinions, people, no. especially people who don't know you. Know no, you, you I know. start from God. What God tells me is what matters to me. Interesting. It's often admirable, though, to come across women in welding, engineering, and construction, and the other jobs thought to be the preserves of men. There are other women, however, venturing into even more challenging work environments, such as mining, where they are dispatched 
several thousands of feet underground to supervise operations. Now, Golden Star Resources has an underground mine at Prestia in the western region with two of such women. Kweku also joined them at work to mark International Women's Day. The interest has to come from the person. You don't have to force the person to come into mining. It's not all ladies that can venture. If you can you get guys saying, my mate saying, we wouldn't go underground mining. But if the child has an interest, if you get a child like me who stayed in a mining town and even get influenced and want to work with them, that's what even influenced me to even choose BSc mining, engineering. If the child has an interest to do it, whether male or female, if the interest is they don't stop it that you're a female, you cannot do it. Meet Gifty Gandhi, young, ambitious, and fearless. She finds working in the underground mines very comfortable. Gifty and Ernestina are both shift supervisors working with hundreds of men almost a kilometer deep into the belly of the earth. We ladies know how to get you the men in that you can get him to do the job, not by shouting, but in a nice way. At the end of the day, the target is achieved. You have to know how to deal with them. Either than that, it's very challenging. It's not easy working as a lady in the midst of guys, but we are coping. Working underground can be challenging enough for men, more so for women, because of their peculiar needs. But these women will not allow these challenges to inhibit them. I love challenging, being and standing, working in the midst of guys. So I say, my God, this is what you are coming to do. Set your mind to it and you do it. Yes, is it a good job for you? Yeah, it's a good job for me. A very challenge. I always like challenging stuff. So it's really a good job. Aside some challenges that I'm saying, working and the pressure of working with guys and other stuff, aside that, that's where you find and That's the career where you find yourself. You need to get it. Do you ever get scared? No. It was my first day when I was about coming on the ground. That scared me. That the moment I go here, I realized that people were working normal and doing other stuff. Why can't I do it? As a female, you have to instruct husbands. So a wife instructing a husband to work. So you can just imagine. Sometimes it becomes a bit difficult with the supervision and everything because you tell your husband to work. He doesn't see the reason why he should work. You should tell him to do that. But it takes time, patience, and then communication. You should know how you talk to them, get them to get the job going because it was men we used to install this it wasn't the ladies and Estina relishes the admiration from people when they get to understand the kind of work she does it's a different thing you know every lady is going to the office wears you scared do other stuff so when you say that they just look at you twice wow this lady is able to do this and she's this and that they just admire you it depends on how you present yourself to them call it dangerous work for a woman or what you may but for these women Working underground is like a romantic walk in a park, and they don't have to look masculine to qualify for these roles. Kweku Owusu-Pepra, Joy News, Pristia. Well, that's very touching. I wish all women a happy International Women's Day. We'll take a break. When we come back, it's time for business. This is Joy News Prime. Now, three persons belonging to a group calling for the secession of the Volta region and some parts of the Upper West and Northern regions into an independent state are in the grips of the Volta Regional Police Command. The three, including founder of the group, Homeland Study Group Foundation, Charles Komi Kujoji, who were arrested on Tuesday, have been charged with the act of treason felony and would be arraigned before court on Thursday, March 9. And Study Group Foundation has been in operation in the country for decades now, advocating for the restoration of the Western Togoland, which, according to the group, stretches from northern region through the Upper East and Volta regions to the Gulf of Guinea. The group has thus been organizing a series of activities, preaching to residents, especially in the Volta region, to join their cause and fight for the separation of the Western Togoland. The group again organized an event on the 6th of March in Ho to remember fallen heroes of Ghana's independence struggle, which was followed by the arrest of three of its members. 
Martin Esiama Agbenu 57 and Divine Odonko 65 are in police custody at the regional police headquarters, while the leader of the group, Charles Komi Kujoji 78, has been granted bail due to his age. The Volta Regional Police Commander ACP Nana Asomahene explained that the police have known about the operations of the Homeland Study Group Foundation, which he believes aims to educate the citizenry on the history of Ghana. He added that the group's intention to proclaim the Western Togoland independence from Ghana on 9th May, as inscribed on the T-shirts worn by the members during the set March event, is a criminal act, hence the arrest of the three. All along, they were just moving around doing their own things. It's a study group talking about issues. So, well, we didn't have much problem. But on the 6th of March, they actualized it, giving that T-shirt indicating that on the 9th of May, they are going to proclaim that uh, part of Ghana as a republic with a flag. So it means they are not actualizing their actions. So obviously you have to move in and see that this thing should not happen because they cannot do that as a group. For Ghana is a whole, it's a country. We don't need any part to go away and do that. It's against the law. Wise Kujoji is the son of the founder of the Homeland Study Group Foundation. Now that we have come to realize that we are not part of Ghana and we have become Ghanaians by plebiscite, and paper and ballot boxes cannot give birth to human beings. And the, our point in this issue is that we have voted, our forefathers have voted to be in union with Ghana, not to be integrated or part of Ghana, but in union. But as at now that I'm speaking now, we have not seen any document. No union document was formed was written down. No memorandum of understanding is written down. So now we are saying that our name, Wasting Togoland, must be given back to us, not Vota Reji or Nore Reji. The Vota Regional Minister, Dr. Achibod Lecha, recently advised the group to put a stop to its operations, which he described as treasonable, warning members they risk arrest if they refuse to heed to his advice. Fred Kwame Asari's report for Joy News. Time to check what's coming up shortly on the interactive segment. And guess who's here? Israel Lai. Yes, Israel, Aisha. we're changing positions. We're, we're swapping <laughs> positions. So on uh, coming up on Joy News Interactive, it's all about women today on International Women's Day. And having brought you all that great programming about the leading women in our society all through the day, we're seeking to bring you into the conversation as well by asking about the theme for the celebration. Be bold for change. How do you understand it? Um, standing up for what they believe in and venturing into fields that they think that they want to be. And then on a day such as this, I recognize the efforts of women like my wife Louisa and my colleague Aisha Ibrahim who combine work with raising the family. So you also tell us which woman in Ghana do you celebrate and why? She knows what she does. She doesn't let the haters get to her. She's strong. She's independent. To know who she's talking about when we come back and do join us interactive proper and then we sought to find out a bit more about these suicide cases and got some rather interesting responses as to why young people will speak to who young people will speak to when they have emotional issues it turns out parents are not that popular something is worrying you you want to tell your father but because your father always frowns at home you can't just tell him all right, so we have all that and more coming up when we bring you during Interactive And I tell you, it's going to be very interesting having Israel here. Now it's on top of the hour. Let's check stories making headlines and police commence investigations into the tragic demise on campus of a 23-year-old student of the University of Ghana believed to have jumped to her death in an apparent suicide. Wednesday's death comes weeks after a similar suspected suicide at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and students are being urged to take advantage of counseling units on their campuses when they have emotional problems. We have the counseling services there open to them, but they don't take advantage of the services. 
26-year-old restaurant manager accused of assaulting a staff remanded into police custody into a story many say is typical of many workplaces in Ghana. But it's not all gloom on International Women's Day, thanks to women such as Gifty and Inestina, who despite the odds that confront them are blazing the trail in an aspect of the mining industry typically reserved for men. We also brought you excerpts of the special edition of our breakfast show hosted by the wife of the Vice President Samira Baumia and also heard from the First Lady on the occasion of International Women's Day. Forum predicts the gender gap won't close entirely until 2186. We cannot wait that long. In business, government hints of reduction in interest rates as Ministry of Finance pushes for policy realignment at the central bank to address the age-old problem. And Volta Region Police charged three with treason felony over attempts to secede from Ghana. Those are some headlines. Let's settle for the rest of our stories. And a 30-year-old woman in Tamale has defied all customary and religious pressures to send her husband, Mohammed Abdul Razak, to court for marrying two women. Aisha Tahiri took her husband, resident in Belgium, and his newly wedded wife, Mohammed Rukaya, to court to seek an annulment of the Islamic wedding, which took place on January 8, 2017. Mohammed Abdul Razak in 2013 married Aisha at the Tamale Magistrate Court under the Marriage Ordinance uh, 127, which prevents him from marrying another woman. Delivering the judgment in court Wednesday morning, the presiding judge, Justice Edward Apenkwa, was emphatic that Mohammed Abdul Razak's marriage to Rukaila Mohammed contravenes Ordinance CAP 127, which mandates a man to be married to one woman. The judge was unequivocal that Razak must not be seen together with his illegally married wife, Rukaila, in any way that creates the impression that they are married. Razak had celebrated his Islamic marriage to Muhammad Rukaila on January 8, 2017, after he returned from Belgium. But his first wife, 30-year-old Aisha, who had hoped that her husband's return would mean a rejuvenation of their marriage, was left devastated by the news. She secured the services of the Legal Aid Board and proceeded to court. Aisha had married Razak in December 2013 under ordinance, a move which was advocated by her husband. Being Muslims, it was expected that the marriage will be by Islamic traditions, which allows a man to marry more than one woman. But Aisha said Razak was so much in love with her and wanted to use the marriage by ordinance to stress that point. I'm very, very satisfied with what the, the judge just said this morning because he, he, he cancelled this newly married, the woman he got married to. So I'm just very satisfied with what happened to this, this morning in the court. I'm very, very excited because I, I was, he took me for granted. I, I was fighting for my rights. He took me for granted and prepared him for another woman, get, to get married to another woman. So I think I'm very okay. Aisha also tells Joy News, before the ordinance marriage, Razak was extensively counseled on the repercussions of his choice. The court held that the accused did not take care of or communicate with his wife whilst he was away in Belgium, but came to Ghana in December 2016 to break the news of his intention to marry another wife to Aisha. Northern Regional Director of Legal Aid, Isa Mahamoud, who secured judgment for Aisha Tahiru tells Joy News, the ruling must serve as a lesson for all. Today also being the International Women's Day, I think that is a big cause for celebration for women in Ghana and other places, because it adds to the emancipation of women. And Ghanaian women should be proud of my client, who has defied all odds 
to be able to speak out and defend her rights and her marriage. A punitive cost of 1,000 cities has been awarded against Mohammed Abdul Razak. Hashmin Mohammed's report for Joy News. Government has been stressing on its resolve to roll out some new programs this year, including the much touted totally tuition free high school education. But on Wednesday, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor George Kwekudru, cautioned government on its approach to the implementation of the free SHS. The former director of the Institute of Educational Planning and Administration believes implementation of the policy will only satisfy a political wish if it is rushed through this year, a comment that has not gone down well with the education minister. First, here is Richard Kwejonyakun's report on what Professor George Kweku Odru said. The Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast is counseling government to tread cautiously as it implements the free senior high school policy this year. According to him, government should learn from the mistakes that plagued and is still plaguing the implementation of the free compulsory basic education where parents and other stakeholders did not understand the concept very well. Professor George Kwekutoku Odru wants the policy to be delayed at least for a year to ensure that the right structures, resources, and most importantly, the sensitization of people are done so quality is not compromised. Uh, there are a lot of things that needed to have been put in place before the wholesale implementation of the free SHS. You know, we need to draw lessons from what happened when the capitation grant was introduced at the basic school level. There are many parents who thought that by the capitation grant, all responsibilities, fund, fundamental responsibilities of parents had been taken care of. And so they didn't see the need of contributing additionally to their own responsibilities, so far as the awards education is concerned. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if now there are parents who think that by the free SHS pronouncement, they do not have a single additional responsibility, so far as the awards SHS is concerned. But in a quick response, Education Minister Dr. Matthew Opoko Prempe says the position of the provost is hypocritical and unfortunate. He spoke to Joy News on the sidelines of the uh, WASI Distinction Awards for 2016. Where, where was the provost when free SHS started 50 years ago in this country? Well, he said has he ever advised? Has he ever advised that those parts of the country that are enjoying free SHS we should stop? I, I find it a bit hypocritical that some people are enjoying free SHS, even though it's with constraints. And when a government is taking a bold step that we should, everybody should have that financial assets removed, financial barrier removed. A provost of a Cape Coast, a very privileged man, saying that some people should wallow in ignorance. Well, he thinks that there should be broader consultation with parents and with stakeholders. I think even you would confirm and affirm that since 2008 has been a mantra. Every discussion has happened. Even in 2012, His Excellency President John Mahama, who didn't accept it, came back to realize that free SHS is where we should go. Go and read the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4 and what it talks about a secondary right to education for all children. Go and read. And I think sometimes when people who are privileged are giving advice, they should watch what they say. Meanwhile, three Ghanaian students having adjudged the overall top three students for the 2016 WASI. The overall best student, Pius Chere, from the St. James Seminary in Sunyai, was awarded a full scholarship by the Universal Merchant Bank, $1,000 and 2,000 cities, from the Brickum MP, among other prizes. Let's move on to other stories. Ghana is branded to be the star of Africa, the gateway to the continent, and many other accolades. But for Information Minister, the identity of the country is not clearly defined, making the brand weak and unable to sell. He is demanding a rethink of the Ghana brand to make it a unique selling product in the sub-region. In an interaction session with the Advertisers Association of Ghana, the Information Minister Mustafa Hamid said 
other less developed West African countries have become the preferred destination for many tourists during their uniqueness. And he says the ministry will seek to change it and ensure a redirection of traffic to Ghana. As a social science as a student, I have always believed that every practice must be backed by theory. That's my fundamental belief about life, that before you go out to do anything, you must have a theoretical basis for doing what you do. And the kinds of work that you guys do, I mean, I, I saw a lot of that um, when I was working at the Media Magic and Research Systems. So therefore, I agree with you that what is going to make the world buy Ghana is not platitudes. We are the gateway to Africa. We are the black star of Africa. We are just singing platitudes. What does that mean? What does that mean, black star of Africa? What does that mean, gateway to Africa? I remember one time um, I was traveling with a friend. And um, how do you call that thing that um, at the airport, when you stand on it, escalator. it's escalator was put and they had barred it with a tape, virtually indicating that you can't use it. And the guy commented, said, hey, but the gateway is blocked. <laughs> you know, this is the gateway to Africa. And the staircase that takes you through the gateway is blocked. You know, that looks like a minor thing, but it is major. You can't call yourself the, the gateway to Africa when even your escalator is not working. And, and therefore, there are things that we ought to change. It's because we have all these little, little, little leaks in our country. And meanwhile, President of the Advertising Association of Ghana, Joel Nati, pledged the support of the group to rebrand Ghana. He, however, wants concerns of the association addressed. Today, what do we see? Around, if you look around Accra, it's a shame, we're in a very shameless state. There's so much clutter. There's danger on our roads. Today, when, when it gets cloudy, just because it's going to rain, people panic because you don't know which billboard is going to fall next. Now, when these things happen, when there's loss of life and all of that, the first thing anybody asks is, where is the advertising institution of Ghana? But truth be told, not everybody who puts up a billboard is a member of our association. So this standards bill will not only regulate us, and we ask for it, but it will regulate everybody. Today, listen to the media. You hear adverts, all kinds of adverts, and there's no method, if you will, to that kind of madness. There's um, condom ads playing at 8 o'clock when there are kids in the car, 8 a.m., when there are kids in the car driving to work. We're playing alcohol ads at the same time. But everywhere in the civilized world, there are rules and regulations that govern our kind of industry. All of these things are encapsulated in the proposed bill. And I'm always, I'm, I, I like to harp on the fact that it's not just us coming up with a list of things that are convenient, but this has been arrived at in consultation with all the various stakeholders. And it's important that this is passed for us. Joy News Prime.